<laughs> yeah. It's a good thing, though. Really, I, I, I mean, I probably, I probably still have it. Um, but well, how long any day work? Do you have any symptoms? Um, yeah, it still don't feel exactly one hundred percent. Um, I have this weird kind of lingering, almost like a metallic taste. Mm. Um, that's strange. And it's brain fog. Oh, really? Are you, uh, what are you doing? Quarantining or, or? You know, I would if I could, but oh. I, I just, I, I kind of can't. Um, just working away. Well, we won't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's not yeah, exactly uh, according to oil, but whatever. I'm not, I'm not a narc. I tell everybody. How you doing, Roy? Yeah, I'm doing good. Yeah. Yeah, we're, uh, um, well, Charles has had, uh, we, we are, uh, Amy doesn't feel good today because it's, I don't know, it's, it's either cold or hot. You know, we got, we have to leave our doors open because the dogs use the doggy doors. And so it's kind of, you know, sort of drafty in here. But otherwise, they, uh, you know, we just want them to be open so that they can. Poop How poop. many doggy doors you got? We got actually three. <laughs> I think we're, if it gets too cold, we're going to close some down. I wanted to get an insulated screen door. And I still might do it. Um, the one we have is, is pretty drafty. I thought if we just get a little more of a, uh, but. You know, we do have one that goes out to the garage, but it's just a matter of adjusting, you know, to they can only go out through the garage. There's and then the garage is somewhat heated. You know, uh, you know, we used to keep the dogs outside all the time. And then after Indy had his two ACL tears, you know, we just didn't feel like it was we could leave him outside in the real cold weather. And because uh, he's, you know, sort of a little can't get up that easy and anyways but before that time you know they would stay in the garage and you know be like 15 below zero and i'd come home and the garage door is open and i got a little heater out there and the, the water is just a block of ice you know and the dogs are lying in their beds you know all curled up and everything and and i go in and tell amy i said hey you left the garage door open. And I said, you know, if you do that, <laughs> that the water freezes and the dogs are really cold. And she looks at me, she says, you know, I'm not stupid. She said, you don't have to tell me the consequences of leaving the garage door open. I know what happens. I left it open, but don't insult me by telling me what happened. You're embarrassed her. You're embarrassed her. Yeah. Don't tell me the consequences. I know what the consequences are. But anyway, that was funny. I, I back, bet I bet I told that story a million times. Back in the in it in the uh mid seventies, uh I invented a doggy door. I had never oh, heard did of you it. Really? But it was a cat door. And mm -hmm. I, and I used magnets and uh I made this little door and and then when the cat I taught the cat how to use it, you know, with his little paw, uh, yeah. because he was being bullied by these cats outside. And uh, so I taught him how to use the door, and it had little magnets in the door, uh, both doors, so that when you batted it with the paw, it snapped back, the magnets. Yeah, you know, snap, it would snap, snap back. back and open. And yeah. so that was the coolest thing. The bullies would come after my cat, and it would disappear into that door. And they, they couldn't figure it, it out. No, they didn't know. They never well, our, figured it out. Our dogs just leap through it, you know, yeah. on complete <laughs> trust and faith that it's going to be open. Oh, you're right. But, but last night there was a possum incident. And the and possum they, figured it out? <laughs> no, they, they, there was, they find a possum out there. We, we have bird feeders, you know, <laughs> right. and, and when the bird uh, oh, the possums are eating down. the seeds, right? Well, no, they aren't eating the seeds, but it attracts night crawlers. Right. 
And they eat. They like the night crawlers. Yeah, and so they it just it, it aerates the soil, and then they just right. eat the night crawlers like crazy. The night crawlers are eating the seeds. Yeah. How, how are you doing, Tim? Good. Oh, great. I've been uh, doing Very a lot of traveling busy. and being yeah, I know. disappeared, but glad to be back. <laughs> oh, great. Well, fabulous. Well, um, we do have a Charles Dream, or uh, uh, we actually got two Charles Dreams. But, um, you know, Tim, if you have a dream, why don't you uh, send it to us, too? Okay. So, yeah. Did, Charles, did you want to start with one of your dreams or not? Um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. What, do you um, want to do, do the first one or the second one? The, the, the one you just sent me? Um. Yeah, that's the do, one where you're kind of upset. Um, yeah, we could do that one, or um, I could Which do. Which one like do you a, think's more important? Oh, okay, go ahead. What were you um, saying? I don't know. I I just had another hamster dream, but uh, okay. Well, go ahead. And it was ahead. it was a little bit different, just because. Okay. But I, I don't know. There wasn't a really a whole lot to it. All right. Um, well, why don't why don't we do it? It's a short dream, and then we'll do do Charles, and then we got two of yours on tap. You know, at some point too, Don, I would like to go through your dream one more time because I think we missed a little bit in it. You know, I mean, I just uh, just it, it it it's such an important dream. But why don't if you got a short dream, uh, uh, Charles? Why don't we just start with yours, and then we'll do Tim's. Okay. Um... So in this one, I was uh, surrounded by like hamster cages uh, and they're like the glass tanks like usual, mm -hmm. but um, I like came into the room and noticed, I don't know, like I just remember that there were there are just dozens and dozens of hamsters like in the cages all just like you know just crawling on top of each other like they, were, they weren't nearly big enough and um, overcrowded yeah and it's like they'd been like breeding um and there are just so many uh in each cage and um I'm just like, I don't know how I didn't notice this and I don't know how I let it get like this, but um, just got really upset over it. Um, and yeah, just seeing all these hamsters just like, uh, uh, you know, to, you know, not have any ground to walk on and just like crawl all over each other. Um, it's very upsetting. Yeah. Okay, now that is a very interesting uh, image. Now, now, uh, do you know where you were? I think I was um, in uh, my grandma and grandpa's house where uh, I spent a lot of time as a little kid. So it, it's, a, it's kind of a, uh, you were in a, a place from long ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're in kind of this original departure pointer. You know, in, in other words, I often go back all the time to my childhood home. But this is kind of your childhood home. Uh, hey, by the way, I'm just going to tell you guys, uh, uh, Charles got co had, had COVID. So he's still got it. Yeah. He's very brave. <laughs> but I, at least he's going to have antibodies. You know, we, we've got antibodies. We've been vaccinated. And then we had the monoclonal infusion all that so anyway you're at the grandmother and grandfather's house and now now just think of this this is so amazing you go into what room was it you went into you know um it was almost like a um, it wasn't really used for anything um it was almost like a guest waiting room or like where you'd yes. have tea with someone. So you you open up the door to the guest waiting room. You walk in and you are surprised because there are how many tanks do you think there are? 
probably like six. Six tanks. All of them are just absolutely overflowing with hamsters. And they're on the floor too. Right? Um, I don't know if any managed to get out, but well, you said you could hardly walk. Is it? What did you Oh say? no, they could they couldn't walk. They could they're walk. just getting trampled by each other. Okay. So now we had uh, one uh, dream where some uh, you're you go into the basement and your um, your cousin what was his name? Uh, Alex. Yeah, he's not not taking care of the hamsters, and you knew mm -hmm. it was now your responsibility, right? Yeah. Yeah. So now uh, now you go into your grand now everywhere you go. There are psychic, uh, uh, it is just teeming with these um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, elementary uh, psychic uh, life forms. Now we've seen them where the snake eats them, where they turn into homunculuses. But here, there is just no end to them. Now, here's the thing that you're saying is that because no one paid attention to them, they just kept breeding and breeding and breeding. And so they kept having more and more litters and they just kept grow, uh, to, till now there is, is, is just no room for them. They are, what does it mean if you look in a, in a cage and they're just, they're, there's no, they, they don't have any refuge. It's just so crowded uh, that um, there is uh there's just absolutely no room to move. So uh, anyway, Roy, what do you, now what else was there? What are we missing? You got upset over it. And then what? Um, I mean, that was, that was pretty much the dream. Okay. All right. Uh, now, Roy, what do you think of all of this? Uh, just um, the, the hamster theme now is just, is is like it's like the sorcerer's apprentice you know <laughs> it's just exploded all over the place what does that mean and he's upset about it well uh yeah i think i think it's kind of humorous here we got this kind of synchronicity here uh at craig's house uh we have this ecology system set up where there's bird seed and then the birds squirrels or whatever knocked that out on the ground and then the the uh the night crawlers like that because it's uh composting and then the possums are coming there <laughs> you see it all starts with food and then and then yeah. the dogs get involved well you see what happens see when when you, you have to they have enough to eat and all their their basic needs met they're going to breed and pretty soon your, your aquarium is going to be too full of hamsters. They're going to be crawling over the top of each other. So, you know, who's, who's the master here? You know, who's going to sort this out? What, what is a hamster, do you think? I mean, a hamster represents to Charles. It's sort of a rudimentary feminine figure. Or is it a rudimentary child figure? Uh, what do you think? Is it, it is it the anima or is it the growing thing within us that never, okay, and it never progresses past the hamster stage. You know, it always stays in this very uh, primitive elementary form. And yet it is Charles Totem animal. Okay. It's his sort of, if he was a, a, a Indian of the Pacific Northwest, his totem pole would have a hamster, you know. So, so the idea, now let's say your totem animal was, uh, let's just say, I, I really can't think, of, can you think of a good totem animal? Uh, I wouldn't put the uh, shoe build stork in there, but um, just some totem animal, you know, myself. Okay, dogs, everywhere. Everywhere I go, there are dogs. What does that mean? Uh, you, you know, I walk, usually the dog re represents the instinctive part of myself that I'm not connected with. And it's everywhere. 
So, so um, yet it, it doesn't really help me out. There's no help to me. But the 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 the, the instinctive uh, uh, aspect is just overflowing in my life. It's everywhere. Yet it's not a help to me. But what does that mean that it's so overflowing? What do you think, Tim? Boy, I'm. I, I guess I'm right along with you. It feels like the animal, um, the animal instinct, the, the primitive anima. I, I can't get beyond that. But no. But it does. <coughs> it does make me think of a collective situation where this is the human beings all over the earth. You know, we've overpopulated and we're crawling on each other and we're, we're becoming brutal to each other. It kind of has that collective um, now that's tone because it doesn't sound, I, I don't know why it would suddenly turn from a, a single hamster that has been in all these dreams and to a whole, you know, a plethora of them. Yeah, how do you relate to a thousand hamsters? You can relate to one hamster. Which you, that's a very good clue, Tim. You can't relate to a thousand hamsters. At that point, there is plenty of instinctive things, but there is no way to relate to that many. In other words, the ego consciousness cannot have an I-thou relationship with a thousand hamsters. So, so the idea here is even though there is a very strong instinctive element, it has become far more difficult for the ego to, uh, to, um, to take this. I mean, the one thing is, remember one time we saw the hamster wheel and then, then it became this kind of a star child and then it became a woman. Now, can you refresh us on that one, Charles? You saw a hamster wheel, but instead there was like a, some kind of a, was it a raccoon baby or something? And then it became a woman? That was, there's like a little tunnel dug right outside the front door of my aunt and uncle's house. And uh, I, I thought it was a hamster and, tried to kind of lure it out of there, but then um, turned out to be a raccoon baby, but shaped like a star and uh, could fly. And I like trap it in a hamster cage, but then uh, there's like the mom raccoon nearby and I, I see it as trying to fly over to its mom. So I let it out of the cage and then he flies to his mom and it turned the mom raccoon turns into a woman yeah. and she walks away with a uh, star. Okay. okay. Now, now let's just put it this way. Let, let, let's say that instead of hamsters, it was water everywhere and we're just being flooded with water. Uh, so, so there's an idea here of the uh, unconscious contents are flooding us. And I think one of the reasons it is flooding us is because um, there's no outlet into the, uh, into our life, you know, that somehow there's, it's being dammed up. The psychic contents in, in within us are, when did you have this, you had this dream last night, right? Um, I think or it was not. like a couple nights ago. It's very yeah. recent. Yeah, but it just seems like the psychic contents have been dammed up. They're just, they're just, now they're just, uh, you, you know, becoming absolutely unwieldy. Now, instead of it being water or, you know, you can imagine, um, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, in that Lucy, uh, uh, I love Lucy thing where the, the cakes keep coming, you know, you know, or, or what, what, there was another one where she tried to make rice, you know, 
or something in her oven and it start, was it either bread or, or rice or something it just started flowing out of the oven. But the, the whole idea here is when you have that many, um, it, it's a crisis. You know, there is just too much of something. And why do we have too much of something? You know, and I, I would say, Roy, do you have a, uh, any thoughts about that? Why, what does it mean when, when we just get flooded with something and then it becomes unmanageable? Well, I, I, I just think there's, there's no master. There's no direct thinking. You know, there's no responsibility. Yeah, I, I think that the one thing that um, is interesting, you, you've had uh, the dream right before this, um, the one where, um, okay, here, here, let me just tell you quickly the dream, um, that Charles um, uh, was at some uh, Christmas party and uh, everyone's very festive, everybody's there. He, um, he goes outside and sees all these lights, but they're kind of artificial pixelated, but they're just, he's just awestruck. And then, then uh, a magical guitar comes. The mother loves the guitar. Everyone wants to play the guitar, but she says, I just, it's a revelation to her how important now remember this is the mother that um had the uh, uh dark uh, door uh, in the hallway with the light under it but she's it is is just absolutely uh um captivated with this guitar and then uh it's time uh, everyone is having a feast charles comes in and wants to to partake in this feast there isn't any. There is no food. So instead of it being overwhelmed with hamsters, he doesn't have any. Okay. Now, at this point, he becomes the dream ego, at least, becomes very upset, starts pounding on the counter because all there is is just some white bread and Pop Tarts. You know, so so the magical feast food is not available to him. All he has is the ordinary food of, of the day-to-day -day life, okay? So um, in that case, there was this, this great shortage. In this case, there's a great surplus. But in, in both cases, in both cases, there is no way that the ego is going to be able to have a, a transformation. There's either too much unconscious or there's too little food for the soul. You know, there's nothing in between, but I think the problem is, and this is the why the, the dream ego gets upset, but the real ego doesn't get upset. And, and it was the, something that came up in Dawn's dreams is there needs to be a participatory uh, uh, reciprocal attitude in the outer world to the dream, the the outer realm needs to reciprocate to what the uh, to the dream is doing, you know. But what do you think, Charles? Now, you, this this unbelievable. I mean, how are you going to deal with a thousand hamsters? There's no way. What are you going to do? What would you do in practical life? You'd have to give away some. You'd have to take some here, some there. You'd have to distribute them until you had the right number of hamsters, which is the right number for you, but you can't deal with thousands of them. Yeah, I don't know. Um, my, um, just, my intuition was just telling me that, like, that it's something to do with um, energy, just like building up and not having any sort of outlet channel um and i haven't uh i don't know it hasn't really uh, ex like gone past that that's just that's just kind of what i think um and how are you uh, doing there i mean you told me that you you have this this uh attitude that that uh in your off hours you can't do anything 
So there was that. What do you yeah. think about that? Yeah. Has that changed at all? Um, no, unfortunately. Um, so basically, you're just eating and sleeping. I mean, working and sleeping. A little bit. Of yeah. Eating. Yeah, I'm not really enjoying it much at all. So in the background, the, uh, uh, you know, the psychic contents are building up. They have no outlet. You know, uh, I mean, you're not uh, able to. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think it's a it, it is is it's a it is a, a period of adaptation to something where before the dreams uh, had your attention and stuff. Now they you, you can't give them much of your attention. And so all these rich dreams that you have inside of you I have nowhere to go. You know, you're not really giving them uh, what they want. And so, so what this could be, all these thousands of hamsters or all your thousands and thousands of dreams you have that uh, are, are not um, getting any attention. But uh, anyway, I, I don't really... Um, know exactly what to say i think you just kind of hit the nail on the head that there's no outlet for them that's the fact that they're getting yeah. dammed up this energy is getting dammed up so it just you know before where there was sort of a process you had a dream you considered the dream you might write it down you might come and tell us about it and then it it, it you sort of assimilated and integrated it now none of that is happening so there's no assimilation, there's no integration. And, and because your unconscious is so active, it's, it's having this problem. Now, the other thing, that other dream is there's also no food for the soul. So, so you know, it almost reminds me of, and, and I, I would like to discuss at some point, Dawn's dream one more time, that you're, uh, you, you don't have any ground to stand on. There's no grounding. You're, you're trapped in the ocean, but you can't, you can't go up either because that's, uh, ego is not strong enough to make an ascent. And so it's just, a, you know, tr sort of in this, this limbo. And meanwhile, the shark, uh, it comes for us. But you know what kind of shark it is? It's the shark, if you face it, you don't get hurt. But if you if you just are living terror of it, it's frightening, you know, absolutely frightening. Yeah, but I, I think that, that that's the part right now that's what's happening. There's no food for the soul uh, in the outer realm. And in the inner realm, the, the energy of the unconscious, which is so vibrant in you, is not having an outlet right now. And so it's just piling up. I mean, you got six aquariums and there's a thousand hamsters in each one because, um, you know, you know they're they don't have anywhere to go. They're just building up. Is it Roy or Tim or Don, do you have any additions to that? Not me, no. Okay. Well, I like, uh, I like Charles' interpretation. And if you don't have a vocation, then there's nowhere for the flow to, to, to the current to go right. And that, that can make a person neurotic. You know, they're, they're going to find an outlet somehow, but it might not be an appropriate outlet because there's, there's no vocation. If you're born an acorn and you know you're going to be an acorn tree, you have a vocation and everything kind of flows along. But humans, they don't know what they are. And if you don't find your vocation in you just kind of get neurotic and, and, and the energy is just all over the place and it's going to go in places. It, it's just going to sit you back. It's not going to be any progress. You know, there are a lot of animals that if they don't get enough exercise, you know, their, their toenails just keep growing and growing and growing, you know, because they don't, they're not worn down by use, you know, so they just, they just get, you know, sort of deformed because they, nothing happened. They don't, are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So in this case, we're, we're being starved of the food of the soul. All we're given are, is what, uh, what my, uh, this girl I knew is 
uh, husband was a great chef, but her, 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 his three daughters, none of them liked, uh, you know, his, he was an absolutely fabulous chef. And he'd, he'd spend hours making this wonderful gourmet meal. And uh, no, they, they want mac and cheese or something. So he'd throw a Pop-Tart on each one of their plates and say, here, just eat this sugar shit. <laughs> you know, this is after he made some meal that you'd spend a thousand dollars to go eat in New York City or something. But, but anyway, it just seems like uh, this might be a little bit about the, the even though I there's two things happening in, in New Orleans and where he is right now. One is he is de, he's getting a new suit of clothes. Okay. But the second thing is he's has to adapt to not having the free time that he had before to uh, to uh, consider the contents of his unconscious. So now is it um, is it one or the other? I think there, it just needs to find the happy medium. You know, do you have any final or kind of sum up, Charles? I mean, I, I think if I consider this dream a little bit more, I might have a little more to say. But all yeah, I know is it's um, a fabulous image. I don't know. Nothing seems quite right. Um, like, I think it's good that I'm working this job. And of course, they already want to promote me and pay me more. And that's wow. good and everything. But I don't really know if I want to, like, my coworkers left at six in the morning today. They're still not here. Um, it's you know, like, I don't know if I want this suit of clothes. Um, one of the first dreams I ever brought into this group was about finding the right shirt. And mm -hmm. that shirt was a very colorful one that would allow me to meet my artist friend and all of his friends. And that's really the shirt that I still want. But I just uh, have a lot of difficulty expressing myself. And um, right now, I'm really like, I'd rather just go back to St. Louis, work in a restaurant, and just as long as I could miraculously be cured and start to consistently produce art um i'd rather have that than work 13 hours a day and like hate my life um how many days a week do you work uh, i'll be working six days a week um, okay now for what don't you get about two weeks off every yeah it's like every month and a half i get two weeks off Yeah, I know. I mean, the only thing is right now, it's such a good paying job. I mean, the whole, but the problem is the six days a week, my, my grandfather, uh, his, his, he was born in 1891. And when he was like 12, he, his father couldn't work anymore. So he had to go work in, in, in Des Moines at what they call bookie pack. And he, he worked 12 hours a day, six days a week. And they paid him uh, like like six dollars a week, and I think his room and board was uh, four dollars a week, and his uh, trolley car rides were two dollars a week. <laughs> so, so he would just uh, you, you know he was just breaking even to work seventy two hours a week, you know. But anyway, he was learning something at the time. Do you think you're learning anything? When you're doing this? Uh, I mean, maybe. I feel like I've already learned every, everything. I mean, if I'm, if I go into management, then I have to, you know, I'm going to have to be actually like dealing with people a lot more and I'll, you know, I'll improve in that way. Um, there you go. I, I mean, that, but yeah. Well, the one thing I would say is, is okay, right now, the only thing is, is you can be building up a resume, 
you know, and, and there's a potential to move into management. And after you move into management, you're not going to be one of the grunt workers anymore. You're going to be more high level and you'll probably I, get better. I still, I'd still have to drive and everything and I'd still have to be the best driver out of the team. And yeah, it'd still be, it'd still be really hard, but you know, yeah. but apparently the pay, the, I mean, the pay is supposed to be really, really good. I don't know. I'm just well, like, the only thing you could save for... up money and right. here's the, here's the plus. You want to do pros and cons. The plus side would be that you get, you're getting a good resume and you're getting good work experience. Even if it's not good life experience, you've got good work experience. And at the other aspect is that um, it might, uh, through networking, you, you might be able to find something right. In this day and age, if you've got a, a really good job and you go onto LinkedIn or something, you might be able to find another job. We, we've got guys that uh, go out and work in, um, don't want to go travel all the time in these PM routes. And so they get it, they can go into one of the places they're, they're working in and get a job there. But anyway, I don't, don't make any rash decisions. <laughs> Right yeah, away. I mean, I gotta, I gotta get a car and get all my stuff paid off before I think about getting a different job. Yeah, definitely. Well, anyway, um, the, Roy, do you have any comments on the on that situation? I think Charles gets it. Yeah. Okay. I hope. And well, now, Tim, uh, we're anxious to hear the latest chapter in this. It's it's a very a very um, it's a very compelling story, really. I mean, I think uh, of what's been going on. I mean, from from these these sort of uh, very um, sort of uh, very uh, almost uh, Dionysian relationships with women, and the fact that we can't connect with them, and then the really elemental uh, aspect. What what do you got for us this time? Well, this. This brings in a lot more elemental aspects. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, great. Let's get it in there and look at it. We okay. call this woman in danger. All right. We went south with a guy from the department, a big fellow who can take care of himself. We were in his apartment, but then Bree and I left. We went down the street and opened a couple of doors behind which were a dorm that seemed lived in, but empty. I thought maybe we could stay there. But then I looked down the corridor and see a gymnasium filled, filled with boys and I realized this is a boys school. Then we go out in the street where my memory fails and then sometime later we ended up in a room with this huge hairy guy who looks like an ape. He was aiming to punch me straight in the heart which could probably kill me. I made an, an escape but now she's in there alone with him. I wanted to return only a few houses to my friend's place, but now I'm not sure where that is. I'm terrified of what might be happening to Bree. Oh, now this is a, a very, you know, this is another um, surprising twist. Okay, very surprising twist. Okay, now we go south with the guy from the department. What does that mean? I just had the feeling that, that this was some kind of uh, group or a, a work situation or something where uh, this, this was a colleague, not necessarily a personal friend or anything. Okay, a guy from the department, but you don't know what the department is. Right. Yeah. No. Okay, now uh, there seems to be some big brutish fellows, fellows in here, and I, I have not remembered seeing... I remember the one guy that you got in that knife fight with, um, but I, and and then there was the husbands, you know, uh, that were uh, wanting to get the, the the crazy woman. I don't remember a lot of other uh, sort of brutish masculine figures, but we go into the south uh, with a guy from the department. So it's you, Bree, and a big fellow who can take care of himself. So it's the three right. of you, right? Yeah. Okay. Now we go into an apartment, but then, uh, so there's three of you in the apartment. 
and then Brie and you leave. So you and the anima are, are going. Now you go down the street and you open a couple of doors behind which were a dorm that seemed to be lived in, but empty. Now this is this is just very interesting. Um, this is, uh, you know, uh, I, I always see this in my dreams. There's a, there's a house, it's empty, there's no one there. Uh, can I live here? You know, I don't know. And it's a little, uh, I, I feel a little bit like an intruder, but no one's chasing me out, you know? Okay, now, uh, I thought maybe we could stay there, but then I looked down the corridor corridor to see a gymnasium with all the boys and I realized this was a boys school so um at that that point now let's wait, let's make sure we uh, when we get done here to look at the chapters okay now now so you and Bree uh, uh go in there and and this is this is um a boys school it's it's we're gonna have to figure out what this means then we go out into the street where your memory fails, but we ended up in a room with this huge hairy guy who looks like an ape. Okay. Now, he is malevolent. He wants to punch me straight in the heart, which would kill me. Why is he so upset? You know, or is he just normal? He's just he's just constitutionally a very aggressive person. Right. Okay, I made an escape, but now she is there alone with him. Uh, I wanted to return. Uh, uh, I wanted to return only a few houses to my friend's place, but now I'm not sure where it is. I'm terrified of what might be happening to Bree. Okay, okay, let's just, do you mind if we just go through this one more time? Okay. I think we, we got sort of the familiarity with it. I'm just going to go through it one more time. Try to get a chapter. Okay. Um, so, so it starts out with a little adventure with us and a uh, someone who, unlike ourselves, uh, could probably hand, handle the big hairy guy who looks like a name. Okay, right. so, it's, so it's Brie, the anima, and I and a very, uh, someone who's very capable physically, okay? Now, uh, so, so we're, we are more capable in other ways. You know, we're more capable on a, an artistic level, on an aesthetic level, and we are very uh, closely, uh, and, and we have this mysterious relationship with the feminine. But then on the other side, the other side is this very active, um, masculine man, okay? So it's the masculine man, uh, our aesthetic self, and the feminine. And we seem to be closer to the feminine than he is. So it's it's really, we are sort of a couple, and he's just our companion, okay? Now, um, we, we, um, uh, we were in his apartment, that, but then Bree and you left. So Bree and you don't want to live in his apartment anymore, right? You want well, to find your own place? Seems like we're just visiting or dropping something off or something. Okay. Okay, so you need to find your own place. So now now the journey is is to find a find a refuge for ourselves and the feminine. So now here's the this is the dilemma of the dream. Is we can't really find the the proper refuge, okay? Uh, we go down the street and and open a couple doors where there was a dorm that looked lived in but empty. We thought maybe we could stay there, but we can't stay there. And the reason we can't stay there is um, we're a, we are an adult couple, and this is a children's school, and we can't live in the children's school. So, so the the idea of the uh, I would say, what what are these like? Uh, uh, just either almost teenagers or or just a little older, not quite senior high school boys. Right. Or, it, 
they seem like junior high boys and they yeah. seems like all of them were in the same clothes. So it yeah. was like an institution. Yeah. It's, it's a, like a, a, an academy or something. Yeah. And, yeah. and so this is not also inappropriate. So we still are, are uh, roaming with the uh, anima. We don't have refuge. Now, then suddenly there is a, 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 a blank spot in the middle of the dream. But now we are, <laughs> so we went from, from the very masculine man into this, uh, to, to something that is, is, is uh, not appropriate for us because it's, um, it's, it's for, um, it's, it, you know, it's for immature uh, uh, males. And then, uh, so then we sort of black out and now we end up in the very primitive, with the very primitive man. Okay, so somehow the anima and ourselves have ended up with the most primitive man. Okay, now the most primitive man is just very aggressive. He's dangerous. And uh, um, the only thing we can do, because he is so dangerous, is we flee, okay? Okay, we flee, but we leave the anima there. So now, <laughs> uh, you know, now where is the anima? She is, the anima is now married. Now you tell me what this means. The anima is now somewhat in, a, a, involuntarily or not, in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a, the, the most primitive man. So huh, what do you think about this? Now, uh, we, we um, and, and then we, the e dream ego is lost. And now you're terrified of what uh, kind of life, your life force, by the way, your nature, your life force, the archetype of life within you. And by the way, you know, this is something uh, that, that Jung says uh, very often is um, that, and Hillman does too, is that, um, you know, the, un, uh, the ego grew out of the unconscious. So in other words, the unconscious is the, um, is the, is the, um, was the source of ego consciousness. It grew out of it. The anima is the archetype of life. She's the archetype of the unconscious. She is the non-maternal aspect of, of, the, of feminine consciousness. Okay, now she is now, this is what Gerhard Adler says, if we don't, if we cannot establish a, 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 a living relationship with our own soul, then she's going to marry our shadow. Okay. And then we've got her and the shadow ganged up against us in the unconscious. Okay, now this is what happened in the living symbol is that the, uh, since, since this woman could not uh, connect with her animus, the animus connected not with the big hairy ape, but with the, um, with the, uh, with a, a, um, uh, a woman of the night. She wasn't really a prostitute, but she was a, she was a, a woman who would have uh, relationships with any man. She was just very open to, nubial bliss or something so uh okay I, I, i'm gonna restate it in a second but roy uh what do you think i i think i'm i'm getting close i don't know i just feel i, I we got to hear what tim uh, says because they'll probably blow me out yeah of who who is are your friend you're looking for your friend's house who is this friend that just feels like somebody who can help me out i don't know him you know he's just a acquaintance or a well, no wonder you couldn't find his house. You don't even know who he is. Yeah. But, but you had this feeling that, that he was out there somewhere, but he didn't show up. 
Okay, well, well, that's important right there. Okay, I'm 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 sailing right here with Craig. I mean, the main point here, and we've seen it before, is is the anima and the shadow have have taken up, and that's a big problem for all uh, for your ego and your personal mm -hmm. self, and uh, you've had that in other dreams, and a lot of us have. It's pretty common, but it's a problem. Yeah, it is. Uh, this is so very stark, though. You know, um, mm -hmm. what, what do you think? Yeah, what do you think, Charles? I mean, I haven't seen it this plain, this plainly said before. What do you think, Charles? Um, I don't know. Um, I I just feel really brain foggy right now, so it's hard to think. But um, I'm just really interested and find it curious how the big, uh, like, gorilla dude, like, just wants to punch you in the heart of all places. He's not, like, you know, just going to beat you up, like, or, you know, like, I don't know, just specifically going to punch you in the heart. I find that uh, really yeah, I punch you really where in the heart. That's very important. Mm -hmm. Makes me think of the like, feeling uh, function. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, it makes me think of like, um, like defibrillating, or uh, I don't know. That's what I, I felt. I I could just uh, yeah. punched right in the heart. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? And. Um, like the uh, the boys' home um, seems like maybe it's um, I don't know uh, that like trying to see if there's like a a place in the past that uh, you could seek refuge, but that not being an option. Um, and I thought I had another question, but let me, um, um, so I don't know. It seemed like that you guys were trying to get somewhere throughout the dream, but it just didn't really say exactly where. Um, so I don't know. There's like a bit of just like kind of random wandering, uh, to the dream too. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have anything more than that right now. Well, that's real. That's very helpful. You know, there's often this, this theme that if we um, are like Parsifal and we can't ask the question, suddenly it all turns the other way. You know, that you're given an opening. You don't take it. And then, you know, the Grail Castle is, disappears. And then, then you meet uh, malevolent forces. Now, the idea here is uh, this is this is. Uh, where did you have this dream, Tim? Just last night. Just last night. Oh my God. Well, well, let me tell you. Uh, just uh, here, here's one. Uh, this happened to me this morning. Is. Uh, uh, you know, you know, I've been. I just go down and I try to uh, see the anima, and I, I go through this forest and everything. And suddenly, I just realize this forest is her. The forest that I keep going to is the anima, okay. And I realize that everything I saw here was her. The forest, the gates that I go through. Uh, that was all part of her as well. And then because that the of, of that, the only clue, conclusion that could be drawn uh, that was that I, um, okay, here was the other thing, that I, everything in my unconscious was spiritual. I came out of the unconscious. So the only conclusion I could to be drawn was that I am here to be her representative in the world, okay? Now then two things happened after that. This was just a little realization. 
suddenly I see uh, the, uh, the, the, the cup of wine for communion, the little glass that you drink the wine out of, and flowers sprout up out of it. And uh, then there's a much larger glass with more flowers. Came. And then suddenly I became merged with a white goat man with horns, you know, and, uh, um, and then uh, after that, I saw the anima. I really did. This happened this morning. I saw her more clearly while I'm awake than I've ever seen her before. And she blew me a kiss and I saw her whole body now instead of her face. Now, the only idea here is, uh, um, is um, that I think the thing is that the anima is not sex. She's very sexy, but she's not sex. Go ahead. Not, what were you going to say, Tim? Was that? I'm just, trying, I'm just trying to hear what you said. It's, she's not sex. Is that what you said? She is not. Um, uh, uh, she is not carnal desire. Okay. She's not carnal desire. She arouses that in anyone, you know, but she is so much deeper than that. She is represents life itself. Okay. Now, this, so, so what's the mystery of the symbol behind carnal desire is, is, is the longing for life. Okay. It's just this longing for life. So I think that, that there is a mystery that, you know, one thing that we need to, to, to get over is um, the beautifulness of the form of the woman. You know, now, and the beautiful, beautifulness of, of her face, how pretty she is, and her beautiful eyes, and her beautiful, the way her face is shaped, the way, how soft her skin is, the, the, her full breast, her narrow waist, and her, uh, you know, her hips, uh, which represent the, the carrier of life, they're all symbols. They are not to be taken literally. Okay, now you're talking to an introverted intuitive, though. <laughs> so you got to keep in mind that. And uh, but but the whole idea is that if we get stuck to the literalness of the woman's form and the fact, oh, let's just say that we identify woman with orgasm, you know, or we identify woman with the um, with the beautifulness of, of, of making love. And that's, that's, that's what we think she is. That's not what she is. Not the, not the internal, internal anima figure. She's archetypal. Now, I don't know. It's sort of like in Charles' dream where, uh, you know, things get dammed up, things get dammed up. I mean, I think one of the, the aspects in, in, in Jungian psychology everywhere, and Hillman will tell you this a million times, is, is, is the curse that's on the kingdom is literalness, taking things literally. Everything, you know, this, this was something that uh, Goethe said at the end of Faust. He says, everything which is... Uh, is, uh, um, what, what's the word for, um, it's, it's not eternal. Everything which is uh, temporary is but a metaphor. Everything which is uh, not eternal, there's a, another word he used, is, uh, uh, is just a metaphor. It, it, it is a symbol for something else. And now Nietzsche comes and says, takes that same statement and just, pulls one over Goethe. They lived in the same town about, you know, and he says, everything which is eternal, oh, everything that is transitory is but a metaphor. And then he comes in and says, everything that is eternal is but a metaphor. So when, uh, the only thing I'm saying is this, is when we're relating to, 
to the anima within. First of all, we are her projection. She is not ours. You know, and that is a great realization. We are her vessel in the outer world. We are to be her, her, um, her vessel in the outer world. Now, so a- anyway, I'm just, uh, what, what do you think about that, Roy? I mean, just this, I think one of the aspects of here, why they would marry, or why our animal would marry the hairy ape is because we don't really understand who she is properly. What do you think? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm going to defend uh, the deadly sins. One of them, of course, is sex, gluttony, and all this stuff. Uh, we, we have a very big problem of that in the West because we think that we've overcome it. But there's parts, we're, we're made of lots of different parts, autonomous complexes. There's probably autonomous complex in us somewhere that hasn't, isn't above it, hasn't got through it and it can sabotage you. So I, I, think, I think you can't be naive. You can't be childish. You, you have to get the wisdom of these deadly sins. You have to taste the cake. You, you have to experience sex. You have to experience these things and, and then you will understand them better and you can gain wisdom from these experiences. You can't go around them. You can't think you're above them. You can't think that you can trounce around them. These are gates that we, we have to have enough experience to know how to get through them. And, and uh, so, so I'm, I'm defending the deadly sins. You know, I think uh, it's, it's not just the deadly sins, just like you say, Craig, but the deadly sin is part of the package. The and, body. And we have to learn how to navigate those most dangerous places. We just can't, you know, uh, psych ourselves up that we're above it you know the one thing to, i didn't right yeah the one thing i didn't mention in that whole long little you know, rant was the body the deadly now, sense has to yeah. do with the body and that's that's Where the trickiest the wisdom that's the trickiest thing because the west likes to abstract and, and they don't understand how the body can sabotage it and that's yeah, the so biggest every, problem that we have in the West is uh, our health and our neurosis and all that stuff because we've, we've tried to do an in run around the body. Yeah, it, the, everything Gerdo said about everything is trans stories, but a metaphor. And what, what, but you have to bring in the mystery of being a, 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 cre- a animal creature. Now, think of this. There would be no consciousness bodies right you know i mean it is it is bodies that bring consciousness Mm -hmm. you know so uh you know it it it, it is in it is in uh it is in in beating heart that you know is on danger because that's very important that the that what does the shadow threaten us Okay. Now it seems like the shadow is driving us off from the feminine. Is 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 almost deliberately uh, is going to uh, is now somehow we ended up with the with the hairy primitive, the anima and us in the same room, and the and this primitive is now going to drive us away, drive us away from the life force. The shadow is going to send us away from the life. And it, it and what does it threaten? The feeling function. I will kill you through killing your feeling function. You know, and uh, what what do you uh, think about that, uh, Roy? Well, the, the primitive is is feelings and sensation. That that is the green man. That is Dionysus. Feeling and sensation, and and there must be some some repressed material, some locked away material in Tim. For, for that type of shadow to have the power that it has. It has great power. It's getting that from uh, something locked away in Tim. Roy, Go the ahead, primitive, Tim. you said the primitive is sensation and what? Feeling. 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 
Don't you think that's the unconscious side of us? You know, I mean, to some extent, we're, we're intuitive and yet we're, we're somewhat abstract and conceptual where the, our, our unconscious side, there's no abstract conceptual there, you know, and, and, and he, it's symbolized by the fact that he is hairy. You know, he's not a, he's not a, a <laughs> you know, some kind of a, 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 like a, a hairless monk, you know, who's sitting, you know, very peacefully. This is, now, now we had two uh, of these very masculine men. One seat was the one we met in the first part. And this is the real earthy element. So it's both earthy, cathonic, uh, feeling, and it's all feeling, all sensation, all emotion, all sensation. And what it is going to do is, now, first of all, Brie, tell us a little bit about her. Well, I'm sure this is my anima figure, but, but she comes in the form of this model I've been working with. And... Um, and in fact, uh, listening to you guys, it makes me wonder, uh, I think you're really onto it, uh, that I've been doing a lot of this, a lot of my work ab about the body. And of course, my whole career is about trying to incorporate what the body is, really is. Um, and the last couple of weeks, I felt kind of full of myself because I... I'm so much farther along in this journey than most of the people I'm surrounded with. But I, it seems like what this dream is reminding me is it doesn't matter what other people are doing. What matters is how I relate to it. And uh, it, it, it feels like the, I'm being presented with two big masculine men. And the first one is is not a problem because it's sort of incorporated in some way. And in fact, the whole first part of the dream seems kind of plebeian and, and not much is happening. There's, there's not really a conflict here. And I can't remember it very well because in the last bit, when I get threatened by, the, by this ape man, I'm just full of fear and, and I'm just seized with fear and I think it even wakes me up. And in fact, I, had, I recorded three dreams last night and two of them were this kind of nightmare scenario. The next one is about a, a mass shooter who's gonna kill everybody. That's, and, and both of those dreams, I wake up with this panic that, that something is really, really, um, trying to nail me. And so back to this one, I, it feels to me like the, the primitive guy is something about the body that I'm not incorporating. And I think it has to do with, um, with, in, with having a dialogue between sex and feeling and uh, emotion and Sure, I've made a lot of progress in that area, but there's something I still don't understand about that. And it's yeah. trying to it's trying to grab me and say, you know, if if you don't wake up or you don't uh, come into consciousness, the the fist is going to go right to your heart and break you apart. You, you know, it's one thing to have sex in the outer world, of the outer realm. And I don't think that the unconscious judges you too much on that, okay? I think, it, you know, it realizes there's just, you know, this buildup of, of, of testosterone that needs to be released. I don't think it really judges you that much. So, so the sex in the outer realm, it doesn't care about that that much, okay? But now let's talk about the, uh, the inner feminine, okay? Now, you, Roy, you just tell me what you think about this too. Because it's just a, a little uh, possible a way of looking at the animal is that the um, the feminine image, the anima image within us, 
the one that's not maternal. Okay. Now the the mothers are very important, but the the what Young and and Hillman say the one thing about the anima it there's no maternal in it. Okay, because it's representing uh, uh, our development, not not our source. Okay. Now, the the idea is this: where does the anima reside? She is our bodies. She is in our bodies. She is the wisdom that shaped our bodies, of which we are unconscious because we're up here. Okay. Now she wants a relationship with us. You know, she's not out here. She's not out there. She is everything below here. This is all feminine receptive vehicle here. You know, now, uh, yet uh, what she wants is to create the philosopher's stone, you know, but it's not going to be up here. It's going to, it's going to be something else. But the idea, so now of it, we can't confuse the, the feminine uh, uh, wisdom, the non-maternal wisdom that shaped our bodies. And uh, by the way, which we, now you got to somehow realize this is absolutely true. We are her projection. She's not ours. So, so she's primal. We're secondary. Okay. So what is the, what conclusion do you draw from that? If she's primary, we're secondary. What does that mean? And she is our, she was born with our body. She is a, a force uh, that is, is unafraid of death, even though she's born with our body, because once our body goes away, she doesn't move. She stays where she is. You know? Now, at that point, there's supposedly, uh, you're going to have a conjunction with her, you know, of some type, you know, but uh, the, the uh, okay, so, so how does this relate to the fact that we can never connect with her? Is it because we think we're primary and she's secondary? Uh, what do you think, Roy? Uh, well, my theory is that it's true. There's, there's nature, mother nature, and uh, there's the anima. And uh, the anima's about an anima is our soul. It's about connecting the ego with the self. And uh, this can be a, a total head trip. I mean, this can be a total intrinsic thing inside ourselves, uh, but I don't buy it. I think uh, what's inside our, uh, the whole world's a projection. Matter's a projection. And anything in space and time, which is matter, uh, is, is a projection from us. And it looks like matter, and it looks solid, but it isn't. It's really just thought. It's really just a mind. And so it's so entangled that when we separate matter, when we separate living flesh and humans uh, from our mind, our abstractions and, and uh, theories and perceptions that we have, uh, and, and we think they're real, and we separate them from the, the flesh and blood, I think we're fooling ourselves. I think there's such a relationship and it's so interconnected that you're fooling yourself to make that separation. That's my theory. And so I think actually having a real relationship with a woman is what our soul wants. Our soul, we're, we're a projection of our soul. We're, our soul has a body. And when we disappear, our soul's still there. And part of what the soul wants is us to have a real relationship with a woman, the, the man and the female, because through uh, uh, beastly things like, like physical sex, it provides uh, intimacy uh, between bodies in the physical world. And, and that's reflected in our thoughts and minds. So, so it goes back and forth like ripples in a pond. And, and that's how we progress. 
I think that's what the soul wants. I think that's how the system is. That's my personal theory. Yeah. What, what do you think of Charles? I just want to say one thing that I've, I've experienced is, is, the, is experiencing the feminine without sexual tension is something that we very, very much lack. You know, uh, you, you know I go in and, and, and talk to, uh, oh, oh, just some uh, nurse that's getting me ready for some uh, medical procedure. It, it's just like a little bit of heaven. You know, after dealing with all this, man, she's so, you know, she's just this absolute uh, babushka of, of relatedness, you know. Really, I'm the only person in the world right now for her, you know, and she's she's just so lovely and sweet, you know, and feminine. And I'm just I'm just basking in that uh, uh, attitude that I'm I, I'm so unfamiliar with. What, what do you think, Charles? The outer feminine, I guess, is what I'm saying that we need to experience to know what the inner feminine is. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just um, an interplay of uh, opposite types of energy. And um, yeah, it's really just all about uh, that sort of dynamic um, um, energy between the masculine and the feminine and um, that's what I you know that's what um, I enjoy um, and I, I know that's what drives me um, it's just you know it, that interaction can take all different types of forms um, doesn't doesn't have to be um, um i mean it could just be a conversation just be talking to someone um i mean i remember um when i went on that one date with molly i mean the amount of uh energy going back and forth and just feeling of aliveness was, uh, um, I mean, absolutely incredible. So yeah, it's all just, just it's just trying to experience that kind of type of dynamic energy interaction between masculine and feminine. I mean, that's, to me, that's what it's about. Well, the great, great longing. I mean, Charles mentioned one time that he's seeing these couples walking along uh, and, and they're just, you know, just enjoying each other's company so, so much. And it just almost drives him nuts to see that because that's this, this longing in him is, is just, uh, it, he's, th this is the, this is what his, um, the Christmas feast that he missed and all he gets is pop tarts and bread, you know, when he needs the Christmas feast and he's not getting it, you know. Uh, but let's just go over it one more time. I love this blend of of a very earthy man like uh, like uh, Roy, with <laughs> sort of someone who uh, exists <laughs> at the borderline, like me. You know, I mean, it's a good uh, blend, and and everything Roy said is very I know is true. That's that. Um, we are bodies and our bodies are, um, are, you know, the thing is spirit is far from the earth. And if it's far from the earth, it's far from the body. It's far from, from the ground, you know, and yet it, what it, what does it provide? It provides a, a, a look down so that, the, that we can pro provide order and meaning. Okay. But it's not, imminent and it's not near it's far away okay now the 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 feminine is 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 uh, is our is our life you know it, it's the life force but let's go through this dream one more time so it's the woman in danger is the name of it so that's a very good name the woman in danger 
So the, 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 the woman that's really in danger is, is our own unconscious life force is in danger. My, if I'm Tim, it's my life force that's in danger. Not the woman, it's my life force. My own nature, my own little earth is in danger. And uh, uh, that's what's in danger. So now um, the, 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 it starts out fairly well. Uh, we, the, 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 our ego consciousness and the feminine are on a little journey. Uh, they're with a, a, a very balanced masculine man, not a primitive one, but pretty much a hero figure. You know, it might be Siegfried, you know, it's this very, it's a heroic blonde, uh, uh, you know, uh, masculine figure. And, and so we, we meet him, but then we, we still, the life force needs a place, um, apparently, an, uh, for us to connect with the feminine, we can't just be, uh, we need to find some place where we can live with our life force. We can't just be, uh, you know, uh, not have a fixed point. Uh, our life force and us need a foundation and a grounding. So we need to find it. Okay. So now we, we are looking for it. And, and now this very mysterious middle uh, section that we find is this our foundation? Is this a place where we can find refuge? Um, it, it looks uh, empty and looks lived in. It looks empty, but it's, it looks lived in. So we're, not, we're, we're a little bit doubtful. But then we find out that it is a, um, it's unsuitable for the mature relationship with, uh, with our, our own life force. On, on, you know, this, this level of conscious, we are conscious of the life force in, in us. It, we're not unconscious of it. We not need to find a, a abode where the, we are very conscious of the life force. And, uh, and we realize uh, what our relationship to our, our feminine inner life is, you know, but we have to be conscious of it. And we, uh, uh, and this is the inner life force. It's not the outer woman at this point. Now it, it could be, uh, you know, I think it's both. You can apply it either way, you know, but it, it is not one or the other. It, if anything, it's both, okay? And um, that, then, um, so, so then we get kind of dizzy, which is a great image. And we suddenly have, fallen in to hell, okay? And uh, this is because we can't find a fixed place, a foundation for, for us and, and the feminine life force to start a life together. You know, uh, one of reciprocal, uh, 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 it, it, of reciprocity and uh, of, of a blending of interests, mutual bonding. You know, and uh, um, so, uh, but so, who do we end up with? Our, oh, we're not conscious of their shadow. You know, we have it. We've we're not conscious of the shadow, and the shadow is very powerful. It's a very powerful uh, being, and he drives us off from the life force. So now, uh, uh, half of our half of our uh, consciousness is now. Uh, on the run away and, and it has to run away. It's left our life force with this very dangerous side of ourselves, okay? And it threatened to kill us by hitting us in the heart. Okay, what does that mean? You know, our heart, when, when you say, whenever you move, move your center of awareness down to your heart, it's a healing thing. And now it's, threatening to kill that healing organ within us. The one, by the way, 
which has connections with every other part of the body, the brain, the lungs, our legs. It's just, it's taking things and bringing things back from it all the time, sending and receiving, sending and receiving. And it also represents love. So it's also going to kill love in us. You know, it's going to kill love. You know, this, this primitive shadow is going to kill love, separate us from the feminine, you know, and drive us off. So we're going to be far away from our own life force. And um, now uh, we, we go down a few houses. We're looking for help. And we can't find help. Now, the only way that we're going to be able to find help is through a miracle. You know, and, and what would that miracle be? You know, I mean, I think really what it is, is a change in attitude. And somehow we have to have a epiphany or a revelation uh, that's going to redeem this uh, part of our, uh, our conscious attitude, which is sick and helpless and powerless, you know, and has this unbelievably powerful shadow, you know. So um, what, how do we get that revelation? How do we make that discovery? You know, I mean, it's, it, right now it seems far away. What do you think, Roy? Uh, yeah, we got a bucket full of clues here. Uh, I, I might also bring in the, the Cal Shed formula. Tim, are you living the survival self? Are you living the personal spirit? Are you in touch with your personal spirit? I don't think this was ha would happen if you were. You, there's a fear here somewhere. And the fear and, and the survival self is, is uh, controlled by fears. The personal spirit is not. That's my it's, last tidbit. Yeah. It's a stark message. It really is a stark message. Now, it's not... Now, Tim, you had a bunch of nightmares, okay? Now, what is a nightmare? Okay, a nightmare is telling us that the unconscious loves us. But the anima and the unconscious within us is feeling great pain. And it's feeling like the great pain because it doesn't feel like we understand it or 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 uh, or having a relationship with us, and that's why it feels the pain. So it wants us to feel that same pain. So basically, we can hit the zero point. We need to go down and hit bottom. That's the only. That is where the, that's where the revelation and the rediscovery is going to occur. We hit bottom somehow. We hit the lowest point. And then when we hit the lowest point and we have nothing left, everything is gone, everything is away from us, suddenly we find the treasure hard to attain. It was there all the time. But we can't find it until we hit bottom. Because all of these other things, which, which we lose when we hit bottom, which we think are our treasure, are not our treasure. They are not uh the, the 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 treasure is is the is is uniting with with uh the the unconscious life force within us which happens to be feminine because you were born a male you know but anyway it's a very stark message i'm not saying stark in a i'm just saying it's clear <laughs> it has clarity you know uh, uh, but uh, not complete clarity because there's a lot of mystery shrouding it too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What, what do you think, Charles? Do you have any comments on it? Uh, final comments? Um, oh, this no, is just I mean, it just seems great. like no. um, I don't really know. I, I, haven't, I haven't really worked with the shadow a whole lot because that Neither am I. is not really... I mean, it honestly just doesn't really even come up in my dreams very much. Um, I I feel like it's mm -hmm. if there's any area of my life that I've 
already addressed at some point that is my shadow. Um, but yeah, I would, I mean, I don't know. I would, I would, um, consult, uh, some freaking Bon France on, uh, on shadow work because it seems like, um, in this dream, I mean, it's, it's, it's being it's portrayed as a large hulking force in the psyche. Um, and it's like, threatening you know, to kill the love within us too. Right, right. It's a really, it's a really big force in your psyche. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, uh, I was. Yeah, I don't know. I'll say one thing, Tim. Though that your dream seems to oscillate from uh, <laughs> uh, something that seems a little bleak to something that's very. Uh, the next dream, you're going to have something that's not quite so bleak. You know? <laughs> no, seriously. Don't you think you have this? There, there's an opposite. There's an a aspect where it takes you down to where there's no hope. So this this dream pretty much ends like we're helpless. There's nothing we can do. Okay. Well, the let me let me just mention yeah. the next dream, yeah. which is about a mass okay, shooting. Sure. Yeah. We're on a college okay. campus downtown by a park outside the student union building. Some guy has gotten a boon and invited a questionable couple, perhaps to receive a housing unit. As a result, this old guy pulls out an automatic weapon. Everyone freezes in fear as he shouts and points and waves the gun around. Then he begins firing into the air and then into the ground and then across the space toward people on the other side. We are all going to die. I'm about 15 feet away, thinking my chances are very slim. And suddenly the gun goes down. I realize someone has taken this guy down and I don't see how. So this yeah, one leaves me with the same kind of feeling, just absolute terror and this is the you know the shadow in operation and it seems like he has all the power and there's nothing i can do there isn't a woman in this one but it's the same sort of feeling just terror yeah, yeah but now the one thing and this came up in in dawn's dream too is that the shark uh, there was this head of a shark it comes towards her and it wants to devour, but nothing happens. Okay. So it's sort of what happened in your dream. And what did you say, Dawn? You said that you needed to have the experience of it. Hmm. She needed to have the experience of annihilation. She's not going to, she's not going to be annihilated, but she needed to have the experience of it. Now, is, the thing is, if you have a near-death experience, you talk about transformation. Yeah. You are totally transformed. It gets After that, you're you different. <laughs> well, you, you just suddenly, there is an absolute different uh, uh, format. Well, anyway, why don't we, uh, I, I don't, Don, I would like to go over your dream one more time and maybe... Uh, <clears throat> We'll do an, another Charles dream. And, and Tim, if you can bring a, maybe another one of your dreams, if you're available, you're very busy. But we can do, a, do it mon next Monday, too, whenever. But um, uh, this, this has been very uh, powerful and meaningful to me just um, because it, it is unfolding drama. I mean, we're, we're like watching a miniseries here. Yeah. <laughs> well, you and guys. I'm sorry you're... that you have to live with it, Tim, but it's. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, it should ask questions that you should have things popping up in you, you know, like, uh, you know, something. But let's let's talk about more about it next week. Well, you gave me so, a lot of material. I can do some active imagination tomorrow with it. OK, yeah, that's that's great. Well, thank you, Roy, again for all. I mean, you're, without you, Roy, we'd be lost because I'm a dizzy guy. And right. thanks, Tim right. and Charles and Dawn. And uh, we'll see you maybe uh, Wednesday. Okay, thanks. Okay, bye guys. See you later. Bye, okay, bye Don. <laughs>